All rights reserved. Hello, this is the Literary Guild's first edition. I'm Haywood Hale Brown, and we have two books and two writers today. The first book is called Birthrights, and its subtitle, and both these subtitles are important, is A Bill of Rights for Children. This one is written by Richard Farson. And the other book is called Escape from Childhood. The Needs and Rights of Children is its subtitle, and it's written by John Holton. Mr. Holton and Mr. Farson are here, and I will let them speak for themselves that substantially they are people who believe that uh, children are kept in separate pens to a degree, I mean in psychological terms, more than they ought to be, and just sort of going from left to right. Mr. Farson, what made you write Birth Rights? The question is interesting because... Um one would think that there would be an incident, or uh, uh, having have five children myself, we'd think it would be maybe uh, a result of uh, experiences with my own children and so forth. I really don't think that's the case. As a matter of fact, I'm not even sure that having children isn't a positive impediment to being able to see the situation clearly. I just got interested in, years ago in the whole issue of invisible populations in the civil rights movement and in uh, women's and men's liberation. and. Uh, then I began to see that uh, uh, the most oppressed people are very often the most invisible people, and especially when you think they're visible, like children. We think we know what children are because we are around them a lot. And uh, then it began, it, it came to me, I think, more uh, as a kind of a rational outgrowth and a logical outgrowth of other interests. Mr. Holt, you don't have any children, and therefore... No, you don't. I don't, and I'm very happy to hear Mr. <laughs> Farson say what he said about possibly an impediment, because... But somebody must irritably people, have yeah. said to you from time to time, what do you know about children you don't have any? Of? Well, they don't quite say that. They say, uh, do you have any children? And I say, no. And uh, and there's they usually let a pregnant silence mm -hmm. sit there, but it conveys the other remark. Did you come around to writing your book more or less out of a general feeling that while this ferment is coming on, some bubbles should rise for children? That was part of it. I think it certainly the things that I'm saying and Dick Farson are saying are, are, are very logical extensions of things that blacks and minority groups have said about their condition and women about theirs. They also have grown out of my work as a teacher and a concern for children and and their their dignity as people and also grew out of a certain amount of experience with the free school movement in which uh, it seemed that as fast as we took certain kinds of pressures off children, or put it differently, as soon as we met certain needs that they had, which ordinary schools were not meeting, other needs appeared which we couldn't meet. And this, I was thrown more and more back on what Paul Goodman wrote in Growing Up Absurd. That what young people really need is a sense of growing in and into a society that makes some sense. And in the absence of this, I came to feel more and more there isn't anything that anybody could do in a school to meet this need. Well, the reason I asked the question of each of you why I was, in a sense, making a, a measurement of zealotry, in other words, in most of the other movements, in the women's movement, in the uh, black movement, in the earlier women's movement at the time of where the struggle was for the vote, there got to be a sort of tremendous and aggressive feeling which brought about a crusading attitude. Now, you are different, each of you, in the sense that you are interested in children and you are an advocate, each of you, for children's rights, but it's a long time since either of you was a child. And do you find that you are working parallel with them or can you really talk to them and find out what they want? Or are you like everyone else, those who are trying to find what's best for them? For myself, it's a, it's a question of... Uh of not trying to mastermind what, what is best for children, but at the same time, not pretending that you can simply go up and ask, mm -hmm. because uh, children are, in our society, a tremendously incapacitated group, and what I'm trying to do, at least, is is uh, point to certain things, make some sense out of some things, see if I can reduce the, the victimization that I feel now, having looked at this thing for several years, is, is obvious, painfully obvious to me, but uh, I... I shy away from any idea of movements and uh, 
liberation and the whole the, the zealotry that you're talking about I abhor myself mm -hmm. and I, I, it, what we really need is to think about very complicated issues in our society we need to each of us become um, members of a multiple issue constituency mm -hmm. not a single issue mm -hmm. and, and uh, so I'm as interested in parents and in and in other vulnerable populations in our society as I am in, in children it's just that nobody uh, had uh, Articulated in a comprehensive way, the uh, neglected rights of children, and uh, so John and I did that essentially. The word liberation, as a matter of fact, was suggested as a possible title of my book, and I, well, I quite deliberately rejected it uh, for, I guess, a couple of reasons at least, because uh, it, it had a lot of associations that I didn't much like. But beyond that, I wanted to make the point that if a if a child likes the condition of being a child, meaning helpless, meaning subservient, meaning, as I say, some kind of mixture of slave and super pet, if he's happy in that condition, fine, I wouldn't disturb him for the world. All I say is that if a child has had enough of living in this sequestered and uh, you know, segregated and powerless condition and wants to live more actively and responsibly, move out into the world, live like a, a full human being, I think he ought to be able to do it. Uh, well, now, is there a, uh, for example, this is a complicated thought, which I'll try to make brief. On the English upper classes, it was accepted, at least in the 19th century, that all children went to boarding school at an early age. Boys. Boys, yes. And therefore, the individual child did not feel, I am being torn away from my family. It is an accepted thing, as in certain islands boys at the age of 12 have a front teeth knocked out or are tattooed or whatever and you don't say yeah i am particularly selected for this therefore what i'm getting at is that the child who is given freedom as in my time when i was a little boy in intellectual circles in new york it was a great move to give children their freedom and to permit us to be untrammeled adults, very young, very small adults, but adults. But I suspect that many of us were not ready because the other children seemed happier on the plantation. I didn't really feel up to the responsibilities that were given me. Would I, do you think, and just you, I don't want to use myself as an example, have felt better if everybody else was in the same spot and had to eat downstairs with the grown-ups and think of jokes to tell to Alexander Wolcott and all of that? I don't know. I, I want to pick, if you'll let me, just a little bit at the expression to give freedom, because I don't feel for myself that I can give anybody freedom. What I'm saying is not so much that, that I want to give children freedom as that I want to take away certain constraints. I want to yes. open doors which have been locked. Now, if the child doesn't want to go through that open door, that's perfectly okay. That's for him to decide. The door ah, if he decides he not to go through the open door, he is, he is aware, inferior, I think. He or she is responsible yes. for his or her actions thereafter and is entering into a large world with very small experience. I think your point is valid, that, uh, that with the freedom uh, comes... Uh, a, a, a burden that mm -hmm. uh, all of us feel. That's not just true for children. That's no, true for that's any true. anybody. Freedom is a difficult burden for us all. And uh, th it falls for me in sort of two categories. One is that there is work we can do. For example, uh, beginning to design our cities more with children in mind so they're not such dangerous places, mm -hmm. which permit children quite unconsciously to be able to move with more safety. Now that's one kind of freedom which does not require the child to come to grips with a new consciousness. It simply it reduces some victimization. Another kind of freedom really asks of the child uh, whether or not he or she might want to uh, enlarge uh, his life in some deliberate way by voting, by getting a job, by taking uh, 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 responsibilities. Now that's a, that's a kind of a political consciousness raising that carries with it that tremendous burden of responsibility and then subsequently very often guilt and and other other problems. I speak of making these rights available mm -hmm. to young people and I also try to make clear that they don't need to be taken as one package. Thus mm -hmm. this particular child might choose to vote. Mm -hmm. 
but he might not be interested in working, he might not be interested in traveling, he might not want to live away from home, he might not care about having his own bank account, he might, none of the other rights that I've suggested might mean a thing to him. Another child might find it very important to work, to have his own money, to control his own money. Politics wouldn't interest him. Some other child might make a different sort of a selection. The other point that that I think is important is that this choice need not be irrevocable. That is mm -hmm. to say, a child having chosen to use one or more of these rights ought to have the option to decide after a while, well, I've tried that, that's okay, but but I think I'll go back and into the family and live as a child for a few more years and maybe try this again later. If he found that burden heavier than mm -hmm. he could carry, he would have the option of going back into his earlier condition. Well, certainly one of the terrible ironies for children, and it's something that I remember with indignation now many years later, is that probably our, as human beings, our intellectual keenness is at its highest from about 11 to 15 or 16, and we absorb vast amounts of material easily. Our brains are really going very well. And how often I, or either of you, at that age of 13 or 14, had an argument of an intellectual nature with some adult who driven from one place to the other finally in complete disarray says well when you grow up you'll know better and you just stand there shaking with humiliation yes. I, there is no answer to that both of you in each of your books have said that one of the ways in which we demean children in addition to when they grow up they will know better is that there is that realm called cuteness whereby a kind of well, almost uh, the same as the, the black actor who turns up his eyes and is afraid of ghosts. The child, by sticking his thumb in his mouth, can become both less and more, have more power and be less of a person. What does one do to discourage this? We don't have to discourage it. All we have to do is make other avenues available for them to have access to life. Uh, the, the problem is that uh, we have forced them into a position of... Uh, all kinds of dissembling, all kinds of uh, uh, cute behavior, just as we force have forced women, quite literally, into uh, using indirect methods of power because we've never had the direct formal uh, access to it. I found myself realizing only a couple of weeks ago, I wish I'd thought it when I was writing, that the, the way in which most of those adults who think they like children think about children is very much like the way in the ways in which old Victorian men, some today, thought about women. I was particularly reminded of Ibsen's play A Doll's House, and Torvald and his wife Nora, and Nora was a kind of plaything, almost point for point, innocence, purity, uh, more spiritual beings but on the opposite side of this rather sentimental way of looking then at women now children is a great deal of condescension and contempt which comes out when I start talking to people about the political changes you start talking about children having their own money or voting and people begin to put forward the most absurd hypotheses a man said give a kid his own money he'd buy a whole lumber yard full of yo-yos and uh, somebody else said uh, Kids could vote, they'd all elect Captain Kangaroo for president, and... Uh, Might not be a bad idea, but well, I don't think they would. <laughs> considering the alternative, so. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, could we do worse? But, uh, in fact, they wouldn't do that. Uh, no, even I as, could, again, even as nice I, a man as Dr. Spock, and, 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 and I really revere him, admire him. I'm not yeah. in the camp of his enemies. But in a recent interview in Cleveland, about the time I was out there, he said something about... Now, parents, you mustn't feel just because the baby cries, you have to let him stay awake all night because that's what he wants. Well, that's absurd. A baby doesn't want to stay awake all night. He doesn't know what all night is. The concept doesn't exist in his mind. This is a projection out of that baby of some notion yeah. of an adult, whereas, in fact, the baby is just saying, I'm having a good time. I don't want to leave the party. Why are you taking me out of the room when here's where all the action is? So when people begin to talk about concrete examples, they express the opposite side of their sentimental notions of children, which are very contemptuous. 
And it's at this level, this combined mixture of sentiment and condescension, that I think we can begin to work on changing our ways of thinking. Do you think that some of that uh, contempt, which has built into it anger, oh, yes. arises from the fact that many people wish their children to accomplish those things which they themselves fail to accomplish and the child becomes an instrument? Of course. I think that's part of it. I suspect that, that the biggest reason we resent children, though, is because we have set up a situation in which we feel responsible for them but are helpless to discharge those responsibilities mm -hmm. and that makes us feel abusive toward them i think that happens when you whenever you feel responsible for someone if even if you're a professional uh you you feel responsible for someone that you can't really help which often happens say in psychotherapy uh, it makes we you pay that man enough so that he better not be resentful. No, I know. I know. <laughs> that's essentially what what it's all about, and I think that's that's what happens uh, very often with respect to parents. We have created just as we've invented children. That is, it's a fairly new idea in the history of mankind that we think of children as potential adults, but uh, we've also invented parenthood, which has become such a terrible kind of. Uh, structure for us all to try and live within and every time a psychologist uh, like me opens his mouth on radio or television that uh, writes a book we make that job more difficult no matter how helpful our own little ideas may be we make the job terrifically difficult we make it seem as if it's possible to raise children and to do it with some kind of class and dignity and good sense and minimum of frustration in love and you know, and I think the fact is that it is not possible to, to well it's been children. said that uh, the people of approximately my generation that we were the first generation which were raised by parents who felt that what we did was our fault you know the parents would say right. oh, it's, it's you Right. And that we came along in an age of psychology, to use the broadest term for it, and discovered that what our children did was our fault, that somehow we never got the best right. of either world. As if we had a lot of control over it, which yeah. we had very little control. One of the things that I think is it needs to be liberated, really, is, is the, the parent who is working quite unconsciously as the agent of institutions which he doesn't fully understand and doesn't realize his role in that, but those institutions do not necessarily have the children's best interests at heart. They have the idea of children's place, that is politically keeping children in that place at heart. But we spend all our time protecting, controlling, disciplining, teaching, uh, as if that's what parenting is. Mm -hmm. And usually we're trying to do something to the child to make him uh, behave in such a way that is acceptable to the institutions which are governing all of our lives. Well, I want to get to something which I think both of you would probably like to say something about. In each of your books, you say that perhaps the most controversial things that you advocate are letting children vote when they're, they feel like voting and letting them drive a car when they can pass a test and letting them handle their own money so you can't say, well, you sold this to the boy and he looks 21, but he isn't. You have to give him back his money, which is in a sense humiliating him and you must give them sexual freedom or at least that same sexual freedom that we give to the rest of society what let me ask each of you and you can answer in whatever order you wish what do you get the most resistance on economics economics and the vote yes those two the money and the vote they yeah. really freak them out you think it would be the se sexual perhaps yeah, yeah. but uh, i think I, I think even Sometimes leaving home gets me make, yes. make their own home. Make their own home. Absolutely. But the vote and the money are number one. It's mm -hmm. just perfectly astonishing how angry and frightened. So when I was I 10 years old, I read, actually read the platforms of all the political parties presenting candidates, which included the prohibitionist and vegetarian <laughs> parties. I read all of them, mm -hmm. made up my mind. I haven't read the platform since. I think I was politically most aware that I think... An awful lot of kids take a tremendous interest in politics. I believe both of you argue that since at any age our voting is likely to be subjective, why not start early? You know, I was talking just the other day to a 14-year-old boy who was uh, 
uh, at a big urban high school, and he he was making the point that in in a sense he was in a much better position to make uh, judgments about uh, voting on national issues because in the, his everyday life he was mixing with so many different kinds of people. He was deliberately and uh, part of their whole school curriculum studying some of the issues. He in fact knew a lot more about what was going on than his parents did. And uh, uh, we, we sometimes forget that, it, as you said, uh, I mean, very few people read, <laughs> read the play. Well, as magazines for black people used until very recently always have very light colored people on the covers, yes, yes. you, I believe, questioned a group of kids where a number of kids said, I would vote if I could, but I don't think I should be allowed to. Children, obviously, given this uh, diminuendo treatment of which you both speak, begin to question their own abilities. Yes. So well, this is one of the things that troubles me most about this institution of childhood. If people say to me, as they sometimes do, well, why do you feel it makes so much of a difference? Well, I... I'm a very old-fashioned person, and I believe in human liberty in a sense that I don't think very many people do. And what I object to about the condition of slavery, and being a slave has nothing to do with whether you're well-treated or not. That you know, Some slaves were exceedingly well-treated. What I, what I hate and fear about the idea of people growing up in a condition of slavery is that it gives them, the, most of them, the minds and the hearts of slaves. You don't learn to love freedom by being a slave. You learn to you learn to believe that that's all you're capable of. And I'm terribly afraid of where this process may lead us. There is a complication, I think, and you may or may not agree with me, that, and I think from what I've read in both your books, I'm more oriented to the views of Sigmund Freud than either of you, that there is a point of at least an early childhood of emotional immaturity in which were you to exercise liberty, you might also begin to exercise repression of yourself at an early age. And it isn't all that easy for children from 7 to 11 or 12 to control their emotions. And maybe they should not be asked to. And if they are a part of a total community, they will be asked to early, won't they? Well, they're asked to now. They they live in this rather peculiar little social world of childhood which they live in is highly competitive full of all of the anxieties and pressures and rivalries and jealousies of adult life you can see it in the nursery schools classes groups of four years old i mean when the birthday parties come along the whole question of who gets invited and who doesn't is of immense importance so it isn't really as if they were living in the kind of pastoral Christopher Robin away from it all with his bear and his woods. <laughs> no, no, no. And I'm not laying that on you, no. but the plain fact is that we, the, the little world we have constructed for children to live in, presumably to protect them from the bad world, turns out to be a rather simplified and in many ways much uglier and harsher and more competitive world than the world we're supposedly protecting them from. But so I'll meditate on that for a moment, and you all can, you who are listening, can prepare your answers to shout at the speaker, and we'll be back in just a moment with John Holt and Richard Farson. I better mention these books again. Mr. Holt is the author of Escape from Childhood, The Needs and Rights of Children, and Mr. Farson's book, Birth Rights, is called A Bill of Rights for Children. I'm Haywood Hale Brune, not a child for a long time, and we'll be back in just a moment with John Holt and Richard Farson and our discussion of the rights of children. What I meant when I spoke about repression, and again I generalized from the particular, I was early expected to be grown up in my household, and I was once told that I was going to be a guest at a dinner party at our house, and I said, well, gee, I'm, it's a Tarzan picture, Elmo Lincoln and Tarzan shows you how old I am, and my mother said, well, you're expected, you're one of the guests at the party. I said, but Elmo Lincoln, Tarzan, and it's two pictures, and if I get in, in the middle of the love picture, Tarzan will run right into the dinner party. And she said, I'm putting you on your honor. And I was seven years old, and I accepted that, and I think it's grotesque. I don't think somebody seven years old should be put on his honor. It was expecting me full of unbridled desires and the, the vigor and violence of youth 
to expect that it was important that I be home. As a matter of fact, being me, I walked out of the picture while Elmo Lincoln was wrestling with a lion. I don't even know if Elmo Lincoln lived to the end of the picture. And I felt all my adult life a resentment that I had been forced out of the simple world of the child. Where I was going to come home late and be punished, and I would take care of that. But I couldn't. Now, I'm not against you, but what do you say to children like that? I get a, a, a number of different thoughts about mm -hmm. your example. It's hard for me to talk about your experience because I know, it was I yours. Know, I should have been all No, 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 no. I think these things are it important. Is, I, I, it I, is I, a problem, I think. I think these things are important. They're probably things about that scene that I might not have liked had I been there. I don't know why you shouldn't have had some kind of choice about whether you went to that dinner party since presumably everybody else who went to it had that kind of choice. Yes, that's fair enough. <laughs> but on the other hand, I don't know that watching a movie about Tarzan is exactly what I would call a simple world of childhood. In fact, you were consuming a rather sophisticated piece of adult entertainment. I mean, it isn't as if... So, so I get different kinds of messages. By and large, my feeling about that seven-year-old is that he ought to have had the option of going to the dinner party as a welcome guest or not as he saw fit. I know when I was, oh, eight, nine, ten, nothing was more really exciting and fun for me than, than having dinner with my grandparents, my father's parents, 87, you know, really old people. Very, my grandfather dressed for dinner, you know, with a black tie and and it was very elegant and formal, but it was magic, this marvelous world of the adults. No concessions were made to me as a kid. This conversation went on. I only understood little fragments of it, but it was wonderful to be part of that world and not condescended to or treated in some peculiar way as a sort of an honored guest. So there, I mixed... All right, I admit that it was a, a very personal example. I brought it up in the hope that I would get a more general feeling as to whether or not at seven or eight, and I don't know where you make the cutoff, but the admittedly Freud and those who follow him believe that we are not leaving puberty aside, we are not emotionally complete until a rather later age than I think either of you suspect. Well, you, your question is perfect in the sense that it does raise for John and for me too, I think, just one after another of the mm -hmm. fundamental issues in it. For example, one is the issue of our, our remembering children, our, our own childhood. And uh, that for most of us is totally uh, totally gone. Mm -hmm. we, uh, we might not have might just as well not have been children for all we can remember about it. Uh, we, we Our memories are so fragmentary and so distorted by adult values. That's one, that's one problem with it. But there are many other problems. One of the, one of the uh, uh, points that John makes is that we, we have then carried with us a lot of myths about childhood, about it being a gentle and a free and delightful and creative time. And if you spend your time, as John does and I do, very often quite systematically watching children, turns out that's not the way children, children's lives are boring and worrisome and not gentle and uh, quite, quite very often uh, uh, different, tremendously different and very complicated. As a matter of fact, there's not very much difference between adults and children, just as there's not very much difference between men and women, really. And uh, I think that we've got to understand... Or could I modify that by saying that the difference between adults as a group and children as a group is much less than the difference between one adult and some other adult, that's or right. one child and some other child. That's right. If, that's if exactly, I can put it that that's way. That's exactly the, the point. But then you also raise the other question of whether or not uh, we should protect people by doing what's good for them. It seems to me that I have abandoned now completely the idea that that is the way you protect people. You protect people best, I think, by protecting their rights to do what they perceive as best for themselves. To protect themselves. To protect themselves. And uh, that's something that when you are trying to do something for someone's good, you almost always undermine the other kind of protection, the protection of a person's rights. And, uh, and, and so in a sense, it's really quite beside the point of whether or not it's good for them. 
because that's not your judgment necessarily to make, and uh, and and it uh, almost always leads to the most incapacitating. And and we only have to look at uh, what we have done for blacks, for women in the uh, in in terms of protective legislation in both instances, that to see how abs- how corrupting and how. Uh, incapacitating that protection has, has left women, for example, without any chance to uh, to have access to uh, leadership roles, to have money. It's put them in poverty situations. It's made them totally dependent. It's uh, made it impossible for them to become managers and to work overtime and things like that. So we call that protection. Turns out not to be protection because it is it has limited them terrifically. We do even worse things with children because they are totally unable to uh, have access to the adult world. And that, I think, is, is not really protecting. You're simmering Side some down. thought, Mr. Holland. Well, I was thinking about emotional maturity. It's uh, it'd be pretty hard to which I look forward. It'd be a pretty <laughs> hard, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's well, well. I'm not sure what's meant by that, but I can conceive of some kind of strength of spirit. I mean, the concept isn't meaningless to me. The question is, who attains it? I don't know that Freud could be said to have attained it. I don't know if he would have claimed that he did. He was full of hang-up, most of which I guess he knew about. It was very interesting to me to read that fragment of of correspondence between Freud and, and Jung in Psychology Today. At least, I mean, I wrote a letter which read in full Ray, the Freud Jung correspondence dash. These guys are psychologists? Question mark. <laughs> I mean, a more stiff neck, unbending. Well, they're nineteenth century man. Sure, yeah. okay. but so I would say, in the first place, I don't know who has this emotional maturity. I don't think very many supposedly mature people do. But in any case, if I doubt very much whether people can be pro- put through some sort of a process which will have this as its result. I, uh, to the extent that it's possible to attain it, I think one attains it by, by what? Making, by making real choices in one's life and having an opportunity to live with the consequences and change them if they're not working out. That is, I don't think one can learn responsibility through irresponsibility or competence in making decisions by not being able to, not being allowed to make any, and so forth. Well, of course, if if we go into human history, not so long ago, things were simpler in that children were necessary economic units as part of a farm or a hunting Mm -hmm. family, and as soon as you were big enough to shoot a little bow or dig a hole or plant seed or whatever, Mm -hmm. you became part of the working community. And the work was not so complicated that you weren't able to do it as soon as you could walk around. Obviously, that obviated most of the problems that you discuss in your book, and that now Mm -hmm. we extend childhood artificially to keep them out of the labor market. That's Children, if I think of the three aspects of childhood that I don't like, one is old and two are new. Children were always powerless. Mm -hmm. They were always effective with slaves. What's new is that they're isolated, they're segregated, cut off from the world, and they're useless. And these two, now I don't like all three of them, Mm -hmm. but those Mm -hmm. two, as you quite rightly point out, they're new new and psychologically enormously destructive. Mm -hmm. The one way in which I think you would get agreement from most of the people who disagree with you about the vote or the economic thing is that oddly children are worse treated under the law than adults and I think both of you have Mm -hmm. examples of people who would get 15 days or a hundred dollars if they were grown-ups who often spend a long time in a correctional institution because they can neither represent themselves nor be represented by anyone they chose I think you can get most people even if we don't change things most people philosophically agree with that children are particularly deprived under the law Yes, uh, but, uh, and there again, because we are, quote, protecting them. Mm-hmm. Th- that came about as a result of what we call juvenile justice, an effort to make a separate code of 
of uh, well oddly when a boy of 14 commits a crime we piously do not give his name because he is a child and then yeah, we send him to right. a terrible hell where he becomes an anonymous prisoner for indefinitely a long time. he's kept there indefinitely that's right now when you come to the the question of the vote or giving them money you get these arguments that somebody would buy a lot of yo-yos or somebody would vote for Captain Kangaroo neither of you I gather from your books thinks that change will happen soon but I do remember reading in the work of Harold Nicholson who I guess he was 80 some odd a few years ago and he died he said nobody could imagine how much drearier childhood was in his childhood than it is now he said you know, all that endless turning over of books of engravings and sitting quiet for the middle class child have children not made much progress well in, I think that there's that's a double barreled uh, mm. uh, question they Entity. have and they haven't that is I don't think there's any question that we couldn't even be facing this issue if we hadn't progressed a great deal as a society. Uh, the, our ability to even talk about it, I think, reflects well on our our, our uh, advanced condition where we can worry about such things as human rights. So in that sense, the child and all the rest of us are in much better shape. In other respects, that is in the alienation from adult society, the child is in much worse straits than ever before. Mr. Hall, what do you think about what was called a, a double-barreled question? Have children made progress or made progress in some areas and gone back in others? The answer to that question varies from child to child, but a child who may have gained in some areas has lost in some others. As slaves, probably more children are indulgently treated even kindly treated than was once the case. On the other hand, I think it was Alexander Herzen who once remarked somewhere that people, he wasn't thinking of children, he was thinking of other kinds of classes of people, could live for centuries with the most outrageous absurdities and injustices as long as it never occurred to them to think that this might not be necessary or that there might be some better way of doing things. Once that seed of doubt and questioning has been put in somebody's head, what had once been a tolerable, if not very pleasant condition, becomes almost unbearable. That is, I think I wasn't particularly happy at 14, but I never questioned the, the basic framework within which I was living. It simply never occurred to me. If I, if I had known then what most 14-year-olds know now, it would have been a, it would have been exceedingly painful. But one of the things that was brought up earlier was that this group, this minority, children have the peculiar quality that all of us once were. Not everybody. I mean, yes. women are half the population. Blacks are different proportion. Jewish people are different proportion. But we all were children. Now the the Opies, that indefatigable collection collector yes. group. Yes. The, I think their brother and sister, husband and wife, know, collected children's rhymes, children's singing. And I said. They thought there was a kind of uh, mysterious line. You were a child for a while, and then suddenly you sort of, you're on the other side of it, and you immediately begin to s cease to understand what it had been to be a child. And therefore, all these people, I do remember, and perhaps you do, saying when I was a child, when I grow up, I will not do this, that, or the other which is being done to me. I'm sure I have done it since mm -hmm. I grew up, because... Yes. When you, all these people, go past that line of childhood and immediately cease to understand why do you suppose that is? Well, I think this is partly because of this modern invention. As uh, Vandenberg in The Changing Nature of Man said, we have created, or events have created, a kind of a gap between children and adults which simply didn't exist. And it's worth noting that Arias pointed out, and I guess other people have too, that an awful lot of what we now think of as children's games, dances, the sorts of stuff the Opies collect are once games that were played by adults and children together. They were party games. They were what folks did, young and old. There's a psychological phenomenon. That is that when you cross over, that is when you get a new power, you have what's called need influence perception. And then all, the, all of a sudden, the, uh, the, the memories that you have are filtered through a, a new need structure, which, which when you're an adult and you join that power group in our society, it is very necessary for you then to see childhood differently than you experienced it. 
in order to con- to do the work of adults, which is to keep children in their place. Mm-hmm. And that's the, that's the real problem. We have to actively distort our memories of childhood in order to to accomplish the task. If you could accurately remember the frustration and the boredom, and sometimes people like John Holt have been good at, at helping us to relive some of those moments in the classroom, for example. They are horrifying and very difficult for any of us. They put us in a situation where we where we have <clears throat> such dissonance. Uh, we we can hardly force our children to go to school, re- remembering that watching that clock click around. You remember that sitting in the class and waiting for it to get to be 10 minutes of the hour. Now, most adults don't remember those times unless they're positively reconstructed for them. And then they remember, and then they feel awful, and then they can't do that job of getting their children up to go to school in the morning. Well, you may remember that Russell Baker in a recent column was picking on terrible things to sentence people. So he said, what? Would political criminals do if a judge said, I sentence you to 10 years in high school? It would be this yes. terrible scream, 10 yes. years of chalk and boredom and watching that clock. I, I wrote, I guess, in the first book, uh, something about nightmares being about school. And I got a lot of rather personal comment from people saying, yes, yes, yes. Since then, people are, you know, psychologists have made rather studies of this and in other countries. And apparently... The school nightmare is an extraordinarily common phenomenon. But I remembered the the thing I was going to say earlier. Three words I try to keep up in the front of my mind now in dealing with children, and I mean two-year-old children, I mean one-year-old children, are dignity, courtesy, respect. I think it's enormously important to try to be polite. I think it's important and very difficult to talk to children in the same tone of voice that we use talking to somebody else. Here I suggest something that any adult who wants to can do beginning right now. The kind of little rule of thumb is if something would be painful or shameful or humiliating to us, then we ought to try as far as we can not to say or do that thing to children. If we could do that much, I think a lot of other stuff would begin to flow from it. And that little bit of dignity, courtesy, respect is something that anybody can begin to work on. Let me give a specific example to those who are listening. I've heard this from a great many people, that there is nothing a child likes less than being asked, what happened in school today by someone who obviously doesn't care about the answer? It is an insulting question. And And why you've grown. yeah, Yeah. Well, yeah, <laughs> as the kids used to say in my class. But it is true. They say, what happened in school today? And you may even wish to answer, and you realize that they have turned the other way and say, can I have the mashed potatoes? Yes. They don't really care about your answer. Yes. In fact, well, probably nothing happened. One thing that uh, we, we can't stay away from it because it is, is so part, much a part of us, we keep wanting to say, well, look, if we would only t- treat children this way, wouldn't it be just an awful lot better? And I agree that it would. I just, uh, and I try to do it in my own life. Uh, but I realize that there is another problem. Every time you do that, you make the burden of parenting even worse than it now is. Because as long as the parent feels now, he not only has to do all the other stuff he's been told by everybody else, but he's now got to deal with this new concept of childhood, a new respect, a new dignity. Uh, That makes parenting even worse, and then that, I think, eventually builds a greater, deeper resentment against one's very own children, whom one loves and wants to love. The the thing we've got to do is to demystify parenthood, to reduce its burdens of responsibilities, and we can only do that by taking some of the responsibilities away that parents shouldn't, just shouldn't have to have. For example, if you have to get up your, your, your children up and go to, to go to school every morning, as the law requires us to do now, because both the child and, and I can go to jail if, if I don't do that, and then that forces a kind of relationship on us that uh, does not coincide too well with the idea of, the, of dignity and respect. Mm-hmm. And, and so I, I personally do not want to get across the idea that I think it's possible for a parent to liberate his or her child. Mm-hmm. I don't really think that's possible. In the in the larger sense, we are all captives of a, of a situation, of a system, in which, unless we make t- systemic change, 
We really can't do the kinds of freeing that we'd like. Yeah, but I'm talking about, you're right, but I'm talking about things much more trivial. I mean, to say please and thank you exactly the way I would say them to somebody in my own age. Just a little, very small thing like that. I think of a young couple I knew many, many years ago before I even got into teaching. We had a then four-year-old boy. I remember them saying to me in our in explaining to this child the rules and regulations of our house and the neighborhood and all of these things to which he, or we think he has to conform, we try to treat him as if he were a very distinguished visitor from a completely alien civilization, utterly ignorant of our rules and of our ways of doing things, but, but eager to learn, wanting to fit in, wanting to do the right thing. This is part of what I mean by respect. Mm -hmm. And it can be applied even in the difficult situation of discipline, which people are constantly raising to me. I think there are a great many cases where we may feel we have to say, or maybe socially obliged to say, well, no, this has to happen, or this has to happen. But it makes all the difference in the world, I think, whether we say this, assuming that the child's instinct is to resist, to do the wrong thing, to go the wrong way, or whether we assume that this child is a social creature and he wants to go along with the action, whatever it is, and, and, and wants to wants to do right, as, as right as socially defined. I've been saying, and I think it's terribly important, children, at least when they start out, are not radicals. They're conservatives. They have no quarrel with the world out there. They just want to find out, how does it work? How do I get into it? How do I take part in it? Now, later on, and it's fine by me, they may get all kinds of ideas about how to change it. But in the start, they really want to be a, a part of the action. People say rules. Children don't object to rules. What they object to, I think, are rules that are made only for children. <laughs> They're perfectly willing to obey all the rules and regulations that you and I obey. They, they hate this, the feeling that, that we all had when we were little, that people were pushing us around just to show they could do it. Mm -hmm. And I find, you know, even at this sort of level of, of, of discipline, of, to, at the point of saying, well, you have to do this or you can't do that, this can make quite a difference. I have an eight-year-old friend now, I see quite a lot of. Now, two years ago, I used to indulge in a lot of kind of affectionate teasing. And I don't do that now unless she has signaled to me in ways we both understand that, that she's ready for a frolic, she wants to play, that she's in that kind of a mood. But otherwise, I would treat her, speak to her with the same reserve, gravity, respect, tact that I would to you. I don't push your red button if I know how to avoid it, so to speak. And this is this way of dealing with this young person is, is rather subtle, and yet I think it's immensely important, and I think it's had a great effect on this. The system makes things difficult. Very difficult. And what you're saying is within it, try to make a friend instead of a pet of a child. Yes. Now, if we had more time, we could give a great many more ways, but I think we have, or you two gentlemen, have given a, a sufficient philosophical sort of push. Don't, you're both saying, I think, worry any more about what kind of a parent am I. If you could get on with your children the way you get on with your friends at a club or a party, it would be a marvelous thing, and hoping that we can all manage that let me now thank John Holt, author of Escape from Childhood, The Needs and Rights of Children, and Richard Farson, author of Birth Rights, A Bill of Rights for Children. This is Haywood A. O'Brien saying goodbye.